Hello everyone and welcome once again to Software Engineering. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope you're staying safe and well out there in this difficult time. I really do. Today I want to talk to you about continuous integration, CI, and continuous deployment, CD, a topic that over the last five or ten years has become a really big deal thing in the business. And there's only so much to be said about the generalities of this, but we will say what there is to be said. I'll walk you through some cases and uh, talk about how it might go for you because it's increasingly an essential part of workflow for every project, every open source project, every professional project, once it gets to some fairly small scale. So let's just talk about why and what. And it starts with this sort of principle that is sort of a mantra of DevOps, which is the field in which CI CD kind of lands, which is this idea that everything that can be automated should be automated. And this is on the face of it, a pretty reasonable idea. The idea that we should always trade people for machines as much as possible because machines are cheap, machines are more reliable than people. Uh, of course, it's kind of interesting when we were talking about Agile not that long ago, maybe you were supposed to have forgotten this by the end of the book, we also said that we value people over tools. Well, you know, it's interesting how that goes sometimes, but here we are looking at tools that we can use to make it need less people and less care to make sure that your project works. I mean, the other thing is, problem with that statement is that automation has its own costs, people costs as well. It, you can easily, if you over automate, end up in a cycle where you end up putting more effort into building and maintaining the automation than you would into just doing the thing once in a while. And this is a very tempting thing to do as software developers because of course it's way more fun to build automation than it is to do things by hand. But having said that, this seems to be the future. We seem to be automating all kinds of tasks in new and cool ways. And we keep using this phrase continuous and obviously Continuous doesn't mean what it means on the surface because why would we just keep compiling things continuously or testing things continuously? Instead, what we mean is every time we make a relevant change to our software, then it gets built or gets tested or whatever needs to be done. And so it's always triggered by change. And that's sort of a key idea in CICD. There's sort of several things you might want to do. Every time that a change is made to the software, you probably want to automate building it to make sure it builds and testing it to make sure it still works. That can catch all kinds of interesting mistakes if you do that. Every time that you are going to deliver a system, you might want to first do sort of as realistic a system test as you actually can. We haven't talked too much about user and system tests yet, but you might want to exercise the system as thoroughly as you reasonably can do in an automated fashion to make sure that it'll work not just on your machine, right? This is a classic of software development is well, it worked on my box, worked for me. And what we're trying to get away with with continuous delivery is to make sure that it's more likely to work for everybody, not just me. And finally, Every time we want to make a new release, that should probably be done by an automated process. Once we've done our delivery testing, we actually push things out there. And for services, that may literally mean updating the running service on the fly when it's, when it's deemed time to do it. And notice that we've talked about this before. The 
it's not just the code that we have to worry about, right? We need to make sure that all the assets are there and in a good form and in place, so files, images, etc. If there's a database involved, we need to make sure the database has been migrated and is up to date and all the data is how it's supposed to be. If we have build infrastructure, we need to make sure the build infrastructure is working. If we have configuration, so classic configuration, things like con config files with things like passwords or URLs or things like that in them, maybe even software configuration about which features are enabled, that kind of stuff. That stuff needs to be dealt with. And finally, you know, there's tests that we need to maintain the tests as well. So we're maintaining a lot of stuff when we do this. Do this. There are other things probably too you could list. You could maybe keep going forever. I want to start by talking a little bit about a case study I went through not too long ago. I want to say six months ago, I got a change into the Rust compiler, the Rust programming language compiler, which is a very cool and very active project, and I was proud to help. What happened there is about two years ago, I proposed a new very minor feature for the for rust uh, it doesn't matter what it is it was something really trivial but maybe useful and everybody agreed it was a good idea and somebody even implemented it but they didn't turn it on by default they uh, set it to uh, from i think warned to forbids wrong here it was set to allow so the, the the new it was a check basically that your code was good and it was set to allow, meaning don't even check it by default, you have to turn this on, because they were afraid of what it might break if you actually turned it on for people by default. So we changed it from allow to warn, I changed it. So after a year and a half, I'm like, why hasn't somebody changed this from allow to warn? And they said, well, why don't you do it? Make a change to the compiler and push it. So I literally went into the compiler, found the place, where it said this feature is allow and I changed it to this feature is warn. It was literally a one token change, so the smallest change you could possibly make in the Rust compiler. It took about a week to finish the change process because of the review and automation and stuff that triggered when I changed that one symbol. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing because it wouldn't have rolled out smoothly or worked the way we wanted if we hadn't had all that stuff backstopping this to make sure that that one symbol change was a good deal. So I make this change of one token, I push it up to GitHub, and one of the first things that happens is it tries to build and test the Rust compiler with my chains in, and the compiler fails to compile because that particular warning was treated as an error and there were a bunch of places in the compiler where the warning went off and uh, that's arguably code that should be corrected in the compiler you can also tell you can also tell the source code for the compiler ignore this in this case allow it in this case and so i had to go find all the places where the compiler was failing to compile and deal with them one at a time. There are a bunch of them. Took a long time to find them all. Sort of iteratively go through, make changes, push, commit you know, my patches to make these changes to make this thing go away. And eventually, you know, I'm dealing with changes in the standard library to make it deal with this because it turns out this sort of bad coding habit, this check caught is was a lot of places in the compiler. So I edit the pull request and wait for the automated continuous integration upstream to run. And when it would fail, it would tell me a new place where I had to go and fix. And that's pretty slow. So eventually I got enough local build and test infrastructure working so that I could actually not push until I'd fixed the rest of them. But that was its whole own hard process. Eventually, I got to where the compiler would, the, the automated testing up on GitHub for Rust C said, yep, this change works, seems fine. Now, 
especially given the experiences we had inside the inside Rusty in the Rust Standard Library, it seemed concerning that pushing a change like this out to the that's effectively a change to the Rust programming language might cause people real problems, in which case it would have to go through some more complicated process if it was going to be accepted at all. And so I requested and got what's called a crater run. Crater is a tool that was built by the Rust team that goes out and tries to find all the Rust repositories on GitHub that it can and takes all the stuff in the Rust uh, repository, official, you know, in the, in the Rust uh, user contributed repository that it has source code for and tries to build all that source and test it. Uh, in my case, it was just, will it build? I didn't really care to test it all. So Crater went around and found literally hundreds, thousands of packages and built them all with my fixed compiler. And we found uh, two bugs. There were two projects, one of which was significant, one of which was less significant, that failed to compile after my change. And so I put in pull requests to those two projects and ask them to fix their source code so that it would compile. Both of those projects were treating warnings as errors, which is why they failed to compile, and they chose to keep doing that, but they at least fixed this new warning. And so then we all agreed that it was all cool, and the pull request that I'd made to turn on this feature was requested, you know, was accepted and merged. So now the feature becomes part of what Rust calls their nightly a uh, branch, meaning that it is a development release that people may use and may try, and a lot of people in the Rust community do if they want to, but it's not guaranteed to be particularly stable or right at any given time. We're doing good because we're pretty sure we aren't breaking anybody's builds by turning on this feature already before we put it on dev. And now people have experience with it on dev and maybe they find some issue that all our automated testing didn't catch. In this case, not so much. Uh, after a while, everybody agreed. And in the next, you know, nobody reported any problems. And in the next stable release of Rust, of the Rust compiler, my fix was in there. Yay, it had made it onto main. So that's a big adventure for a small change, but that's the kind of process that we go through literally dozens of times a week with the Rust compiler. This is a very large, very active project, and there's so much stuff going through this process, a lot of it a lot more significant than what I did, most all of it much more significant than what I did. That, And so in that environment where literally hundreds of people are working on literally millions of lines of code at a very rapid pace, you have to have these automated tools. They, they will save you just worlds of grief. So that's sort of the success story of Rust automation, of Rust CI CD. So how does this all work? Typically, and this is what we're gonna concentrate on in this course anyway, you know, a real common thing is to use cloud containers on the machine that's hosting the repository. So what's a cloud container when it's at home? Most of you know services like Amazon, uh, S3 and Microsoft Azure and Google uh, Google's thing all have these giant server farms and you can ask for virtual machines on there. That's the cloud that you can run stuff on. You can pay them a little bit of money and you get a, you get a lease essentially on a machine that you can go run stuff on as, to your heart's content or at least to some content. And that's great, but you really, a lot of times, want to have an environment that's not exactly the environment that's on the machine. And a typical way to do that is using what's called containers, which are essentially emulators for a whole operating system and environment that run on our run on a system and provide the 
and you can then you know run software inside the container and it thinks in whatever it's in so microsoft azure is linux based but as you can imagine a lot of the stuff that's done on there is done on windows containers inside those servers because people want to run windows stuff so how does this work well in our case it's probably going to be github actions which is a scripting syntax, you know, scripting setup so that you can script how CI and CD is going to happen up on GitHub. And GitHub generously for open source projects and small projects will provide these services free for, uh, you know, rent, literally will pay to rent a cloud time on Microsoft Azure for you without you having to pay a cent. For larger projects or corporate projects, you have to pay, obviously, a little bit of money to get this service. Anyway, so GitHub has set it up so that you can very conveniently, using this GitHub Actions setup, build Docker containers that, Docker being the normal container thing these days, build Docker containers to run our stuff in and it will upload them to the cloud behind your back. There's other choices, by the way. You don't have to use Docker or GitHub Actions. You can use Travis CI. That's a popular one from before GitHub's Actions existed that's used on there a lot. Uh, you know, but in any case, now, every time you're ready to release a system, the system is automatically built and realistically tested. So typically the way you set it up is every time you create a pull request up on your central Git repository, then the continuous integration is automatically invoked and it will go and make sure that your stuff compiles. It'll run any tests you have. And so then you typically wouldn't merge the pull request until all of that passed. So it's a completely automated check that gives you an idea the, of you can merge it. And then when you're ready to release, then you can ask GitHub Actions to actually build the release and test it for you, sort of in a realistic environment that's like the one that's going to be running on it. In fact, in multiple environments, you can say, well, this is supposed to be cross-platform software. Build it and try to test it on Linux and Windows and Mac, all three. And if your software is a service, a web service, for example, then it's not uncommon to say, well, what it means to release the system isn't to distribute programs to the world, it's to actually update the system. And so this process of once checks complete, it'll actually auto-update the running system for you uh, using tools like uh, maybe Puppet or Chef. And those are tools for auto deployment of software across a whole bunch of systems that you control that tries to make sure that everything goes smoothly there. Puppet is a local project. Um, that's fun. And once you've done that, then you have some confidence in what's going on. So all that sounds pretty cool. You know, you can read more about it in the book. You can read more about it other places. How might you get started? What I would suggest is what I've done. I should be really clear here. I'm kind of a newbie to CI, CD. I've built software for systems that use it, but I've never really managed it much myself. There's a couple of tutorials on GitHub that I can really recommend, these sort of learning lab tutorials that walk you through a bunch of exercises to get used to using GitHub Actions and Docker for CI and CD. I really recommend the GitHub Actions Hello World, which will give you a very vague idea of what's going on, and the GitHub Actions Continuous Integration, which will walk you through a more complicated scenario and show you how this works. So, you know, to some extent we'll be learning this together, but those seem like really good starting places. So that's what I have for you today. I hope that was useful. Again, please try to stay safe and well in this difficult time. Thanks very much for listening, and I hope to talk to you again real soon.